Well, that three-movie vacation is over after Velma, so now it's time to get back to the real work of examining the Witcher blood origin. Before we do, please, subscribe to help build my kingdom so you don't miss a new video. Episode 2 opens right away with Brad Williams' girlfriend Meldoff looking for an elven sergeant at a place where a bunch of elves are doing Afro Man proud. Pint Size here is brushed off by the man who answered the door with, once again, another opening litany of F-bombs before he slams the door shut. Bite Size then speaks with her hammer because she's loopy, before breaking into the house and off-screen somehow manages to kill everyone despite being in an enclosed space swinging a long-handled war maul. Funny, I figured this opening scene should have played out more like the first kid's death in Goblin Slayer, but whatever. So after almost a literal minute and a half, she manages to get out and waddles off to go and smash another day. Then, jumping over to the bathhouse, Balor and Eridin are discussing the growing contempt of the people, since eggs and gas are now over four dollars each, and Eridan is concerned that the people will rise up. Balor doesn't think this is much of a problem until Eridan mentions that the main heroes have were spotted in Gaelth. How? Not sure, but Eridan has already sent troops to intercept them, which will probably arrive in two nanoseconds. Then, for the second time, Balor brings up how this is a story the peasants can latch on to and use it to inspire themselves. I'm sensing a pattern here. Anyway, he's ordered to make sure that they're dead, but obviously that won't work. So, jumping over to the incompetent trio, they stumble upon Brile, which has never been defeated in over a thousand years until today. And finally, we get a genuinely smart decision by the cast. They leave! I guess there are upper limits to the absurdity of this show that the woke tards behind it will accept. The trio arrives at an open field with a 3D object and some 2D paintings. Man, talk about low budget. Yet another town with heavy oriental influence, which is supposed to be medieval Poland, but whatever. Anyway, they've come looking for coin to hire cell swords. And since they have no legal way to get the money out, they decide that they're going to just rob the bank. And so, when they barge in, they find that the whole thing has been emptied by the citizenry already, and it's looking an awful lot like the Silicon Valley Bank. In fact, the only things of value in the bank, as the teller mentions, is them. He even points to their wanted posters behind them. And when they find it, they see that there's a dick joke drawn on Fjall's face. You know, for as absolutely terrible as it is, even Rings of Power didn't stoop this low. Well, I guess a horse was set on fire by accident, so maybe not. This right here should absolutely confirm the contempt the showrunners have for this series and the source material, if nothing else. So not only was this list of writers awful at their job that I mentioned before, they are also too immature, only proving my point that writers today are nothing but entitled children. Then a large group of guards arrive with someone leading the way that we didn't see before, and the three Three Stooges get into it with them, and it goes about as well as you would think. Armor for extras is made out of paper, the guards attack in pairs at best instead of walking in, assessing the situation, then attacking as a cohesive unit. Stuntmen stand there waiting for the actors to catch up since almost no one has hit their cues this entire time. The main characters brush off fucking death strikes It would have literally killed anyone whose name isn't in the credits, like this stab to Cyan's spinal column that would have rendered her more useless than Joe Swanson. Then, after the fighting has finished, Finished, the three are huddled in the back, and the guards try to burn down the bank with them inside. The trio then huddle around the escape hatch, but can't get in because it is made out of dwarven steel. But Cyan gives Elfing Tatum a dwarven steel sword that instantly chops off the dwarven steel lock of this dwarven steel hatch. How the fuck does that work? Are these Pokemon rules? I smell Dragon-type beating Dragon-type bullshit here. Besides, he swipes the lock instead of using the sword as leverage to pop the lock out of place. Dwarven Steel doesn't just shut off the hardness of itself, but then again, these are the kinds of writers that think armor is made out of paper, so whatever. They jump down, and they escape. Back in Zentrea, Merwin trots down a hallway, and some random dude pops up to try to assassinate her. While struggling to fend off her would-be killer, a young mage pops up from literal nowhere and kills him with the Force. Back in her room, Aridin explains the assassin was a kitchen hand angry about the famine, and of course, she decides to make this young mage her personal bodyguard. And his name is... Krevanes ben Ayabkam Hamacha, but most people call me Avalar. No. No, the fuck it isn't. You are Bob. 
You are Bob the Elf now. So jumping back over to the trio who managed to escape the bank, we find that they are being tracked down by a future party member. Then further up ahead, they stop so they can find herbs to help clean Cyan's wounds before it gets infected. Then we immediately jump back over to Merwin and her... braids? Like the hairdresser probably should have been fired for weaving what could have been used to net catfish. Anyway, Bob is here because Crazy Eyes wants him to spy for her, as she is certain that Sad Sack Burroughs is going to have her killed. She wants Bob Bob to steal a book that contains information about how to open portals to other dimensions, and while he does that, she is going to see what is happening outside of the palace walls. And check this out, I hate when lines are added in later, but they didn't even try to hide it. Watch Bob's face when he says this line. Why exactly? Why exactly? Why exactly? You see that? His mouth closes when the line starts. Whoever edited this should be fired. Anyway, despite having eyes and ears everywhere, Crazy Eyes goes outside and walks into town with a camera so far up her ass you'd think that she was looking for Ashley Graham. And you might think this is just bad camera work. And you'd be right. They did this so that more lines could be added in later because we're supposed to have people complaining and shouting in an attempt to emulate Portland, Oregon, but it doesn't work when everyone is walking around like everything is just fine. Crazy Eyes is the only one being directed to react negatively to things around her and it shows. So in order to get away from the bad direction, she hurries into an alley and she crashes straight into Aridin, who doesn't react to the fucking Empress being out of her room. The dude makes eye contact with Merwin and we're supposed to pretend that he didn't. And he won't notice because he's too busy being pouty and he stomps away because he has a boner to pick with his lover. Yeah, if that wasn't fucking easy to predict. Anywho, Aridin vents to Rufio here about how bad things are before we cut over to Sadsack Burrows in his tower and his assistant showing concern about Aridin, to which he reassures her that nothing is to be concerned about. Back in the forest, the hunter stands over Cyan when Fjall and the Larper confront him, and what the hell happened to Fjall's eye? It wasn't like this earlier, was it? Alright, it was like this when they got to the forest, but it wasn't just after the fight in the bank when he got punched in the face. Maybe he fell into another hole, I guess. Regardless, the Larper pulls out her knives, which must be sheathed in stone, because they always make this sound effect when she pulls them out. Anywho, sir, the hunter introduces himself as Kal-An, or Brother Death, and is welcome to the group. Cyan then speaks in her delirium, and Kalan asks the LARPer to smell the wound, which is now in her armpit. Holy cow, did the writers not share the same room when they wrote this? Did they not communicate with each other, or the director? Cyan was struck in the back in this same episode. How on earth did this team mess this up so badly? Anyway, Brother Mohawk mentions he knows a healer of sorts who might be able to help, and so the trio sets off on this long journey to the Forest of Mists by turning around because they're already there. And wait a second. They made Cyan walk? Even if the group happened to be down the street, why aren't they carrying her? Shouldn't she be conserving her strength rather than keeping her active so the poison doesn't pump through her? I'm amazed that she doesn't look like Bernie Lomax at this point. So the smoke machine operator is a little too enthusiastic at his job, and each member walks into the mist separately and sees memories followed by visions. Elfing Tatum sees his brother die and then gets drowned by crazy eyes while the LARPer burned people alive, including children before finding out Mazel Tov. It's a bird. So the visions, as you may have realized, were showing both the two lovebirds and the witch Zachary? It, ple please stop. Stop with the normal names being butchered so you can pretend to sound cool. Avalanche, Zachary, Eilie, Caitlin, and Cyan are not cool just because you decided to butcher them. So, as I was saying, the mist revealed their memories and intentions to find out if they were honest when out of nowhere, Discount Donald Glover pops up. How? How the hell did you get out of that tower? Well, no answer just yet, because we have to cut over back to the Mighty Kids meal that apparently tracked down the guy who raped her and killed him. Why did we need this scene? With this side story concluded, there is no potential payoff like finding him later and besting him in battle. The writers robbed their audience like a hooker whose time is up. Oh, and I couldn't forget to mention this, she didn't even smoke the pipe. It is all CGI. Alright. So with the time-wasting scene out of the way, we jump back over to Sad Sack Burroughs, bringing children through a portal to meet the villainous Blue Sparkle. You see, the two kids are special. They are celestial twins with high potential and magic. So? 
they are killed so that he can get a taste of their power. Oh yeah, so much for the trade-off in magic. I guess those pesky rules and limitations that helped to make the world more believable got in the way. Anyway, the next morning we find Crazy Eyes in Rufio's place. Outside the city walls again, because sad sax guards must all be cross-eyed assholes. Then these lines are said. Sometimes luck simply casts a lot against you. This has nothing to do with luck and everything to do with awful writing. You made eye contact. You were walking around in your freshly pressed Prince Charming Halloween costume. You ignored the supposed peasant with clean clothing and made a beeline straight for your lover's place without returning to the castle. Fuck off. So anyway, Crazy Eyes, now with attachable Dreamcatcher accessory, is here to make a deal with Eridan. She won't expose him if he helps her to overthrow Sad Sacks. Back in the adobe forest, Zack heals Cyan, and Fajal asks the elfish Gambino what happened in Zentrea. Apparently, it was both he and Sad Sack Blue Balls that opened the portal to the barren world, which resulted in him getting locked away in the castle. Somehow, Donald Glover saw both the rejected Mortal Kombat animation over here vaporizing everyone, and Crazy Eyes killing Elfing Tatum's sister. Hmm, sorry, let me put my glasses on because I didn't hear you right. How could you possibly know that Crazy Eyes killed Fajal's sister? I know my ears aren't the best, but I'm pretty sure from this vantage point, according to my observations, the only thing you can see here is, ah uh, yes, a stone wall. So how in the holy hell could you know this? Well, no time to dawdle on that, as Glover explains this world and others are merging together, which is causing many problems throughout the world and tearing it apart. In order to stop it, his plan is to teleport the group into the palace grounds and destroy the master monolith. Fucking rewind a moment there, how did you escape again? Presumably you couldn't use magic or you would have just tried to do something earlier. And if you had, but not until later, then Sad Sack would learn that you're not in your room, that you were locked in, and would conclude that you might try to do something later. So just the idea of you going back and hoping to destroy the Master Monolith, which should have guards around it at all times, is already a stretch. But again, that doesn't answer how you escaped that room specifically. No? No answers? We're just gonna jump over to a bunch of guards squatting in the woods that are about to be killed without physical contact with the actors? Okay. So Glover opens the portal and they end up in a new world with two moons because the writers have to squeeze out as much blood from this turnip as possible. We're lucky they didn't badly photoshop Bleak Falls Barrow in the distance. So while the group tries to figure out what happened, the LARPer pulls a Prometheus and wanders off to touch something like a proper scientist would. And what do you know? It goes was badly right before cutting to black. Jiminy Cricket, that first episode was awful, but this one managed to outdo all of that. Fight scenes with even less logic and just as awful choreography. Characters who can magically do things without the need of reagents, as was already established before. And blatant ignorance of information in front of people. And with only two more episodes to go, I almost dread how bad this is going to get. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.